thanks to all of our uh, uh, VIP panel guests here for attending the, the final session, actually session and a half. We have awards coming up here soon too. So anyway, thank you guys all uh, for attending today. Um, just going around and talking to people. I had some great conversations today. So you know, it seemed like people were really appreciating the content. I'm grateful to all the presenters. Just uh, I learned a lot, even just the few sessions that I attended. So anyway, big thank you for everybody that was, was speaking today. Um, the sort of the last bit here was we just wanted to open it up to some experts here, uh, some questions about user experience, enterprise, enterprise transformation with some of our key guests here. So I'll do a really quick intro. We, we don't have a whole lot of time here, um, not to rush us, but anyway, we'll keep it kind of the point for my questions. And then whatever these folks would like to share kind of as a lead on. And then if there's people in the audience that have questions, we'll leave time for that as well. So. Um, anyway, that's the format. Hopefully that was all kind of clear. So uh, I think everybody had already met Sam. So uh, hi, Sam, <laughs> uh, from JP Morgan, uh, Chief Innovation Officer there. Aaron Gardner, uh, Senior Vice President at Ecolab, had a very nice presentation earlier on their transformation, really a, a work of art <laughs> in progress. So thank you for attending. Mark Kermish from uh, CNH, a longtime partner of Mindset, formerly Target and Excel Energy in many places. So. Big fan of Mark's, thank you for coming here towards the end of the day. And Don uh, Newton from Integris, who's the CIO there and uh, leading a whole lot of really exciting transformation work. So anyway, thank you guys for attending and I uh, appreciate being here. So, all right, so uh, since Mark just got here, may I'll start with you and just put you <laughs> on the hot seat. Awesome. Uh, so one of the topics we talked a lot about today was around sort of innovation and AI and automation and um, you know, I know that you're a person that thinks quite a lot about that and what it means to your organization and just some of the examples you've shared with me have been just delightful to learn about. So, you know, how do you sort of stay up to date on that, the, the technology and the trends and what does it mean to you and your organization? A great question. Uh, and I think probably first and foremost, I'm a, probably a bit of a new gadget guy junkie, right? So that kind of helps. So I'm naturally curious and uh, you know, my team often asks like, hey, Mark, how do you stay on top of all these things? And I said, well, instead of playing video games, this is what I do on my Sunday mornings, uh, is peruse the headlines and play. Um, you know, second, I think, is, is creating a culture of innovation, right? So it's encouraging my staff to be curious. It's bringing those types of ideas to our executive leadership team. So we just had an example. We brought Microsoft in, and we walked through all of how they're integrating OpenAI into their product set. And we wanted to do that in front of our CFO and our CEO because all of a sudden they can see what the art of the possible is. And we had teams out there that were doing some pretty interesting proof points. So, you know, we took all of our manuals of all of our vehicles and we loaded them up into a chat GPT capability to be able to enable a service tech in the middle of a field to say, hey, how do I fix and replace the gasket on this hydraulics? And it'll go through all thousands of our pages and say on page 54, on this manual, you can find that answer. So now they can immediately go find that. Um, but to me, it starts with that, you know, setting that culture of, uh, you know, try, you know, try things, be okay to fail, fail with things, share what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, as we were when kids is, is stay, stay curious. That's great. That's great. Um, Don, so kind of building on that a little bit and sort of the theme of innovation, I know one big movement that you've been considering a lot is, is the move to a cloud, right? To sort of cloud ERP and sort of migrating your, your infrastructure overall. Can you talk a little bit about your journey as you move into the cloud and what you're thinking about there and, and maybe that how that may help you innovate as you go forward? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about two different things around the cloud. We won't talk about all the SaaS systems and, and things that a lot, of, a lot of people do up in the cloud, but Number one is advanced analytics. Um, we actually decided to pick Google Cloud Analytics to be our, our cloud um, big data per se environment. But the big reason why was to take and be able to integrate from data sources all throughout the organization and put it up into cloud analytics and then start building a data science practice, not only capabilities out of IT, but in the business and be able to drive um, value. And one of the things that we do is any use case we have needs to have, be able to fund itself. So when the business comes and say, oh yeah, we wanna just see this data, it's not just seeing the data, it's about the business value behind that. Um, and the second area is around SAP. We signed, uh, last end of December, we signed a contract to go to SAP Rise. 
Um, we still haven't selected it. Are we going to use Azure, AWS, Google? Um, but over the next two years, we're going to be moving up into the SAP Rise uh, environment. So still more to come on how successful that is. But uh, I mean, for, for us in SAP, I mean, they're kind of painting us into a corner to go that way. I'm sure everybody has, <laughs> has seen that. But uh, we had an opportunity to, to sign a contract that was beneficial so we didn't with the latest acquisition didn't have to pay you know write out a huge check for a bunch of capital or perpetual licenses but move to the cloud base so. great aaron when i watched your presentation earlier you talked about this this sort of massive transformation consolidation of your systems moving to something like what 95 countries <laughs> you're, you're trying to migrate all, all ahead of your sort of S, s4 implementation um you know what sort of when you're looking at also sort of transforming your organization, this customer experience, what metrics do you use? Like, how do you decide what makes it successful or not successful? How do you measure that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think there, you know, you can look at data to say, hey, how many APIs do you have? Are there, what's the customer utilization? And things like that, which we do. But I think ultimately it's, you know, the, the customer experience, <clears throat> whether it's a global Marriott, if it's a, a courtyard in Minneapolis to a, courtyard in Bangkok or full service Marriott. What is, what is our true customer experience and are we delivering value? So we've got multiple divisions that surface, service the same facility. Do we surround that customer with our offerings and deliver clear and concise value? And can we merchandise the value that we are ultimately offering them? Which the, the digital component that we, we roll up will be able to facilitate that uh, you know, in the future much better. But that is, that is a clear, clear way to get there. And, and what we're really focused on is a delivered value to the global customer base. Okay. And Sam, um, you know, we kind of talked about, you know, some of these similar topics are about, uh, you know, investing in innovation and sort of, you know, where do you, where do you put money in? Where do you place your bets? You know, as somebody who's leading innovation at one of the, yeah, I think the largest bank in America, you know, how do you decide where to where do you put your chips, right? Do you, do you spread it out wide, or do you kind of identify just a few of these, or, or how do you think about you know really <coughs> where to focus? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of a portfolio approach, right? So I, I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I gave a definition of innovation, but but uh, one way to think about it again is the again McKinsey, Accenture. I, I don't remember who came up with the framework, the Horizon One, Horizon Two, Horizon Three. Um, and I like that one a lot, right? Because a lot of your business um, is going to be what you deliver every single year. That's what most of the organization is being measured on. That's what the street measures you on. Um, so there's a significant portion of quote unquote innovation that just is improving existing processes, making things a little bit better. Um, and you know, that's what pays the bills at the end of the day. Um, but you need a certain portion that looks a little bit further up, right? So. Um, and Horizon 2, I think, is this area which is, which is really kind of interesting because um, most organizations are being disrupted by some sort of startup. You know, at, 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 you know, no matter what industry you're in, you know, there's a bunch of VC money, or there used to be much more last year, uh, but there's still a lot of money uh, that's looking at um, um, and disruptive types of innovations. Um, and, and that's an area where I think large organizations really struggle. Like, how do you how do you bet on something that may become a reality in the next two to three to four years? Um, so you, you really need to kind of convince the organization there's a, there's a uh, th there's an area that um, um, may not pay dividends right now and may not be part of kind of the um, how you're being measured um, on on today. But if you don't invest in this area, then you know the ramifications could be pretty important and, and pretty uh, pretty existential in the next three to five years, right? So, so there is that portion. And then there's the, the Horizon 3, which is, quite honestly, unless you're a really, really large organization, you probably, most organizations don't really invest in the five to 10 year plan, and that's mostly done through partnerships with universities and, and those types of things. But I think, I think that portfolio approach, um, and then being able to, um, it was the same thing when I was at SAP, I, you know, it's a big enough company. Like, for those Horizon 2 things, if it's not going to generate a billion dollars in revenue, the opportunity, then most people don't even like care about it, right? Um, uh, because it just takes so much effort to, to be able to spin that up. So it has to be big enough, um, but there has to be some sense, sort of sense of urgency, and you really have to play up the what's going on in the outside world. What are your competitors doing? What are the startups doing? Uh, to really kind of get that kind of mindshare. Great. Anybody 
have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, it was kind of, I guess, from my perspective, the thing that was coming to my mind is don't be afraid to pull innovation out of the organization when it's appropriate, right, and have it run as a part of a separate entity. And so just an example, you know, in our business, we're getting hit in multiple fashion from autonomy to electrification to alternative fuels. And so as we moved into it, we took two. We took electrification and autonomy and decided to create an autonomous electric tractor. We actually pulled that out of our traditional product development team and put that underneath our CTO organization and ran it like an internal startup, yeah. right? And part of the result was is it was the fastest product development market from concept to commercialization in the history of the company. And we did it because the team had unconstraints from the bureaucracy of the company, right? Now the challenge will be is we have to eventually graduate it back into the institution and none of the employees want to go back, right? They're like, wait a second, I like this way of work. I don't have to work with any of the rules or confines of our org. Uh, and so that's a piece we're trying to figure out now, but you know, it kind of opened up the company's eyes as, you know, we can be a different organization when we take some of those constraints away. So I have some more questions, but I want to leave a chance for somebody from the audience if you've got anything at this point. <laughs> Nothing yet? John had one, I remember. John? Yeah, um, so I, I wrote this one down for an exam, but I think anybody else can guess what's in it. Um, what, what are a few of the steps or tactics that you take to kind of create a culture of innovation within a company? Wow, that's a whole presentation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, th I, th I think it starts with, you know, trust that, you know, you've got support uh, to take risks and try new things. Um, and, and I think it starts from there. Um, I talked a little bit about this in the presentation. It helps to have a, an executive sponsor that, you know, really uh, is open to that, that, that line of thinking, will shelter, will allow you to do things differently. Um, I, I told the story, um, the original app house was SAP doing consumer software literally pulling this this team out of SAP, uh, out of the office and opening up like a, we just rented space like we were a startup company in Silicon Valley um, and, and providing the, the, the shelter for that. So I, th I think that's where it starts with is, you know, getting, making sure that, you know, there is somebody, um, an executive that's sponsoring what, what you're doing and then doing everything you can to to protect and, and shelter the team and setting your own, setting that culture, rewarding uh, people to, uh, to think out of the box, you know, bring new perspectives in. Um, and then you know your job, if you're if you're managing such a team, is just shielding everybody from the larger organization. I know, Aaron, you talked a lot in your your presentation about sort of creating a culture for growth and for opportunity. You know, does that sort of fall in line with? Do you also think about creating that culture where people can sort of take chances or or innovate or? Uh, Maybe I'm getting too far ahead of myself, no, no, but I, I don't I know mean, if you have any feedback on yeah, that. Yeah, we absolutely do. I think historically, I've been there you know, almost 25 years, and historically, boy, you didn't really want to make a mistake, and I would say we've really transitioned to it's good. I mean, you're, you know, what are you going to learn from it, and how are you going to improve upon it, as you, as you mentioned, in, in the future, but, but allowing the team to really take risks, to try new things. I mean, one of our biggest selling products was a food and beverage product that now we're utilizing to clean floors because somebody thought it would be cool. It's an enzymatic thing, a floor cleaner that eats grease. I mean, but it was designed specifically for the food and beverage facility, mm -hmm. not for restaurant floors. So somebody took a risk and it's one of our best products. I mean, and, and that wouldn't be there today had it not been to that culture shift, which, which we see, um, and, and many changes, I would say. And, and now it's really, it's customer centric, it's growth centric. How do we look at a customer, not at the division level, but holistically, what, how can we add value to that customer now? How do we cross sell? How do we, you know, it's not just a specific division taking care of, of it. So yeah, it's expanding, but, but allowing the team to really try new things and, and experiment really facilitates growth. And you can't be behind them with a stick saying you screwed up on this or whatever, you, you know, you gotta embrace that. Yeah. One thing I would say in my experience just working with a lot of the customers here in the room is that we'll oftentimes find it's not a whole organization will be static. Not everybody in the organization follows all the same rules. Oftentimes you can find an individual who's willing to sort of take the right risks, not, not stupid risks, but they're willing to sort of um, you know, try something new and, and be ambitious. I think, Mark, you, you oftentimes played that role, I think, in a lot of the different organizations you've been a part of. of you know, you're always able to provide the leadership and insight and get things done, but you're always able to sort of take the chance to push the limits. And uh, you know, I think that 
we've found that in a lot of the customers here that you know, if you find that right partner, you can make a lot of really exciting things happen, even if it's an organization that's traditionally kind of you know, conservative. So anyway, that's, that's my yeah, experience. I think, I think the, um, the biggest stifler to innovation is just the word no, right? And it's not a necessarily a pure technology uh, analogy, but I was walking through the hallways of our Chicago office and an industrial designer you know, cornered me and started talking to me about I, you know, our seats and our tractors suck, right? As a, as a farmer, you drive like this all day long, right? You're looking behind you, but your vehicle's going forward and it's a traditional chair. And he's like, you're making me use a virtual simulator to try to solve an ergonomic issue that's fully physical. He's like, I can do this faster with wood nails and some welding tools. And I said, great, go find a tractor we're gonna scrap, go pull it into your workshop and go for it. Right, and I'm like, I have no money for you though, <laughs> right? <laughs> and by the way, I don't really, I don't know if I can carve out more time than what you've got on your day, right? I can't take you off your other work. And he's like, all I needed was the, was the yes, right? And then he went out and he found a tractor, he Frankenstein seats together, uh, he cobbled dollars from his, his department together, and he's now got a working prototype where we've got a, a chair that pivots. And it's almost like a command chair where they can turn the chair sideways and they can change where the clutch is at and the steering wheel, and all of a sudden we're solving ergonomic problems for a tractor operator who's in there for 18 hours a day. Yeah. And so the easiest thing to do as a leader is just to say yes, right? That's great. Uh, Joe. This, this really could be to any of you up there. Uh, um, how do you balance risk with compliance? Uh, you know, coming from a regulated Looking at me because I'm in a bank. I'm looking at you because you're a bank. All of you guys really did compliance at some point in that cycle. You know, I was at SAP for 14 years and I thought working for a German software company, we'd have a lot of regulations and compliance and governance. It's nothing like working at a bank in the US. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I will say this. Um, Constraints are sometimes good when it comes to innovation, right? Um, I, was, I was on an innovation panel with, and the Cisco person at the time said, look, the, the thing that uh, um, is, is difficult for innovation of large organizations is there's too much money, uh, there's too much time, there's too much love, uh, and there's too much hate, right? Too much, too much, too much, too much. Um, and, uh, and sometimes constraints you know, force you to, uh, to really focus and and it helps you kind of drive uh, drive to a solution. So I think that's the way we treat it. We just, you know, we, we bring our legal controls, compliance people in from the very beginning. Um, and those are just the constraints. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you don't want to be dominated by the constraints. You want to be focused on who it is that you're solving for, what is the real need that you're trying to solve for. But these are just some of the constraints that you're working on. Yeah, I'll just add to that. It, you know, it's interesting because, you know, when we acquire a lot of companies, and we're trying to go at lightning speed, but we still need to be SOX compliance. We're a public organization, and now cybersecurity risk. We need to make sure we don't get attacked. So, you know, from a from a SOX standpoint, I always sit there and say, "Hey, it's it's not negotiable. We have to make sure we're compliant." And then when you're looking at cybersecurity risk, and you know, and I sit there and get with the team and say, "Okay, how can we move fast and use cyber as a mechanism to move the business fast instead of saying no. And, and, it, and sometimes it's getting creative because you can just sit there and say, hey, we gotta segre segregate everything. We've gotta put firewalls everywhere. We can sit there and say, hey, we've gotta put all these roadblocks versus taking a look at it saying, how can we get to yes? And how can we do it in making sure we're secure, making sure that we're still compliant. 
Um, and, it, and sometimes it's just sending them back to the board and say, hey, I just need you to get together and come up with options and recommendations. I was, I was, I was gonna add one more thing. Um, sometimes the, the constraint actually becomes the opportunity itself. I, th I think we started to realize, hey, we're really good at this regulatory stuff. You know, what if we offer that as a, as a service or a product to our customers? Uh, this is a slightly different topic. Um, this one is for Don, uh, but anybody can, can chime in as well. Uh, you know, obviously you've been investing a lot in IT and, and building something for, for many years in Integris. As you go through sort of the year, how do you decide when you're gonna buy something like SAP or a pre-made product and when you need to say, look, we're gonna chart our own path, we're gonna build something new, or kind of this buy versus build. How, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, we are a buy versus build. I mean, really, I mean, the whole concept of, buy, of building an application from the ground up is, is really something we don't consider. Right. But we need to make sure, but then you look at, I would sit there and say, it used to be that you'd only go with the proven technologies. That's totally changed. You know, definitely willing to take risk with startup companies, new technologies, and it used to be even, even with the proven companies always be N minus one. That's out the door too. Mm -hmm. So in order to be innovative and to be out in front, you need to take risks with some of these startup companies, even though they may get gobbled up or they may need to go out, they may go out of business. It's just a, a totally different risk um, tolerance level than we had years ago. Interesting. Aaron, do you have something to share? Yeah, that? benefit and effort, I think. You know, what, what's the benefit? What's, what are you delivering? From a, from a cost standpoint or cost reduction standpoint, what's the effort to implement it? And then a side note is, is what's the support, right? So we've utilized a number of different, you know, organizations to help build or, or, or help um, facilitate items, but what's the long-term support footprint look like when, when, when we're implementing something that's global, whether it's a, a WMS solution or an LMS solution or whatever, what is the ongoing support globally? Because you can look at a, a company that maybe is you know, US-based company that doesn't have a global reach. So I think that the support's a huge factor for us as well. But benefit, effort, support would be my perspective. Yeah, I'd, I'd say for us, it's uh, there's a level of complexity I would add in that. You know, for us, an example is we have a very complex supply chain and we looked at a whole bunch of off-the-shelf products around a supply chain control tower. And then, you know, the work effort to connect everything up, normalize the data, you know, we couldn't justify an investment in a built product. Um, we had too many stories of, you know, those that made that choice having to redo things along the way. And so we actually chose to go greenfield in that regard. And, uh, but we chose to do it only if the company would fund it as a product, right? So we moved into a product construct for that. And so you've got a value stream of product funding, you've got consistency of the team, You've got a dedicated business owner for it long term. So it becomes an internal product in that regard. And then we set very aggressive goals to show value. Yeah, I know, um, you know some of my experience, I think you know, Rob here was from Target and I know Mark here from Target as well. There used to be a lot of context in that question around, is it highly differentiated? You know, are you actually gonna create some unique value as a company through this? And then we should invest in this. And if it's some sort of industry standard, then why bother, right? I think mm -hmm. sometimes it's maybe it's in supply chain or a certain retail aspect or, but I'm, I was just kind of curious other perspectives on that. We often think about that in your days from SAP in the reverse as a partner, where would you want to invest in helping to fill the gaps in the product portfolio versus, you know, just work on them as a service to try to implement those that kind of let you out of the box. But I, I, I used to think about the, hey, if it's not core, then, you know, outsource or you know, look, look for a partner until I started working at JP Morgan, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to, to your point, because uh, when we bring in a partner or, or even if when we acquire, uh, sometimes our, our standards, especially the cyber standards are so high that we end up rewriting a lot of the stuff anyway. So it's sometimes it's just faster just to do it ourselves from scratch. Interesting. Other questions from the audience? I have a few more queued up, but is that Kyle back there? Yeah, uh, hey guys, I was just curious, uh, Uh, 
Um, you know, it's a great question. I would say, if I think about it from a product perspective, what we sell our customer, we would say we do customer-centric innovation. So there's very little that we do without actually being in the field with our customers. So the reason that industrial designer got so passionate about this project is he spent two weeks during harvest season with farmers. And he's like, my back hurt, right? Uh, and so, you know, it kind of sparked his, his creativity. You know, we often have brought our dealers and our customers into the company to have open dialogues like this of like, you know, unconstrained thinking, you know, what do you guys want us to solve for you? And then it's a lot of show and tell. Hey, we're working on something, can I call you up? And so I've got a Rolodex of customers and almost every day I'm on the phone with one of them like, hey, we got something we want to show you. Remember that conversation from a year ago? As I back it into IT, it's, it's harder, right? And so like one of the first things I did when I joined our company is I asked, so who's been on a farm, who's been on a construction site? And probably less than 1% had ever been on one. And so, okay, job number one, let's get you guys in the field and actually experience the products that you're supporting from IT so they can start to bring that customer's perspective back in. Anybody else have something to share on that one? Any other thoughts? Hmm? I was gonna say, hopefully the board is aligned with the customer needs. Right? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of IT representation up here, obviously. So you know, one question, in pretty different industries, I think, it, that are represented. You know, what do you, so far this year, obviously it's a different year than we've had in the past. There's some dynamics that are happening, certainly in the economy and the world. What is your main business sponsors just crying for right now? You know, like when you actually see the change from last year to this year and what you're being asked, you know, what, what's the top of the list, kind of top three things that are, are really standing out for you? You can kind of take that one any way you want. I don't know, Aaron, if you maybe want to start. Yeah, I, sure. So <laughs> difference between last year and this year, I think, you, you know, more in-person collaboration, definitely. Um, but that's we've got global reach. I think executing quickly um, now and, and doing, you know, we went through the pandemic deploying vastly remote, which was really tough. Um, so it's pivoting to an in-person kind of hybrid type model to, to accelerate our, our trajectory, really. So um, results, I mean, what, you know, that what's the focus area is delivering results, enabling digital and enabling the customer experience is really what, what the focus is. Uh, but, but when you drill down into that, you know, I, I would say more in-person collaboration. There's a hybrid component. I mean, we've been working remote now for, for some time, but, but it, you know, there's no substitute, I, I think, for, for in-person collaboration, cross-functionally. So the business is really saying, hey, work, work more closely with us. Like let's let's work more closely, get things done, build that relationship, execute more efficiently. So true. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Absolutely, that's great. Don, yeah, in, in reality, they're looking for more, which is interesting. You know, how much more can we give? Um, <laughs> but if you look at it, when you do an acquisition, like so you're doing a major acquisition, and and that's one division. So that's impacting one division. So the other three divisions are, per se, starved. You know, they want. And in, in the semiconductor industry is really, what I kind of say, messy to manage right now because there, there's this need for capacity building. We're building a new plant in Taiwan. We're gonna build a new mega plant in, in Colorado. We're doing plant expansions everywhere. So we're building up capacity, but the industry is flat if not down right now. So we're controlling cash. And we also need to help the business manage inventory and making sure that we cut and make efficiency. So it's one of those things where, hey, we're getting pulled in multiple directions and we can't just add a bunch of staff right now because of the industry. So it's kind of, I always say it's messy to manage right now. Terrific. Mark? Yeah, I, yeah, I think for us, you know, if I were to put a theme over all of it, it would be simplification. Uh, and that kind of metastasizes in automation up and upgrades are probably the two biggest things that we're focused on. So automation is automating crappy processes. And you know, part of that starts with redesigning them and going through the value stream process or a Kaizen process to get to a better outcome. As an industrial manufacturer, we've starved our plants for decades. Uh, and you know, kind of the, the point that, that we brought to the table last year is when times are good, right? we have no time to actually do these upgrades. When times are bad, we have no cash. 
And so, you know, how do you actually kind of flip that model? So now it's like, let's invest now and let's staff up to get through some of these upgrades because we know we're going into a down cycle. And if we can get out ahead of it, we can get these commitments funded and moved. And when we come back out, all of a sudden we've got a whole bunch of tech debt that we've life cycled. And by the way, that also results in automation and simplification along the way. Sam? Yeah, I, I, I guess I would say, um, anybody here about Silicon Valley Bank a couple? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought um, that was on my list to not ask. Yeah, I, 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 I can't go into the specifics about that. My colleagues are in the room here as well. Um, but um, I, I, I think it's just, you know, how do we um, support our, our, our customers and potentially new customers um, and, and always, you know, be a symbol of stability um, through the crisis. Um, and um, as much as we can, take the perspective of the customer, their experience, uh, and figure out how to best deliver um, a world-class experience for them, right? So where technology kind of plays a role in that, you know, that obviously helps in terms of volume and scale. Um, but just in general, like the, the experience, whether it's an in-person experience or a technology experience, that's, that's really what we're emphasizing this year. I had one more, but if anybody else has a question, they can, you can go first. Jill? <laughs> Put you on the spot. No? That's okay. You'll come up with <laughs> one. All right. All right. Anything from anybody else? So one parting question. Oh, Andy? All right. There you go. So I know you all work in, in different industries, so there's probably no uh, common answer here. But from your from business perspective, what are the most uh, exciting and It's hard to not say generative AI. Um, you know, I'd say generative AI in the last, call it three months, has written every job description I've had to post. Uh, we've started using uh, GitHub's Copilot to see if we can get to a 30% improvement in our, our developers' capabilities and productivity. We're seeing some getting as high as 60%. Um, and uh, as we kind of look at how it's getting embedded into things like, you know, Microsoft Excel or Power BI for Microsoft, you know, the need to be a Excel guru expert and the productivity gains in finance, you know, we see as tremendous opportunities. Um, so that's probably been the number one latest topic, not to jump on a trend, but. Yeah, I would say, you know, for us, it's, it's it w in order for us to get the AI, you need the data. And so we, we have a lot of catching up to do, and that means that we need to connect our R&D labs and our manufacturing environments from the ground all the way up and do that in a secure manner. And so that's something that the company is investing money in. And so it's exciting for IT, but it's gonna be exciting for the company when we can get to the point where we're actually collecting all the data from our manufacturing and labs in order to actually drive actionable data-driven decisions. Aaron, Sam, I mean, yeah, I mean, you don't have to if you don't want to. Digital <laughs> insights um, on where the gaps are within our customer base, global customer base. We've got shared customers across divisionally. I have something that I mentioned earlier. So where are the where are the value gaps that we can we can provide for that customer base? So we have similar offerings. I mean, there's regulatory and compliance differences globally, obviously by country, but we've got offerings that that we can we can do for for the same customer that is in Australia or here. And are we really taking advantage of that and delivering that, that value for that customer? So I think those insights gathered from, from our digital platforms are, are really critical for us now. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I would add, I agree with everything, uh, you know, the continued consumerization of, of IT as well, um, how things you know, just become more and more easy to use. Um, um, I, I, we've been along in the industry long enough uh, where like it wasn't too long ago where you went into the office and you got the coolest stuff, the biggest computers, the biggest monitors. Um, and, then, and then I think 2000, year 2000 plus, it shifted. Um, and then you know, the, the games were better than, um, the, you know, the, the web searches were better, everything was better from a consumer perspective. And that trend continues you know, with data, AI, 
So that was kind of my, actually gave me my sort of closing question. So you oh, already sorry. answered it. Well, no, it's, it's good. You got a good <laughs> head start. Um, you know, like we said in the opening remarks, you know, 15 years ago, people didn't talk about, there was no summits for user experience, right? Especially in IT. It'd be, how do you train them into submission at IT, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was probably the topic. Um, and I've seen it come a long ways. And I know, Sam, you, you remarked that, you know, you've seen this progression in the consumerization of IT, um, and that's fantastic. So maybe just sort of closing for the three remaining guests here, where do you see that on the journey at, at your organization? Do you see it actually, uh, and I don't know how you would measure it, but are you all the way there, home run, there's user experience groups, it's adopted, it's understood the value of it, you've got it built, or is there still a long road uh, ahead before it sort of realizes that true value? So, I don't know, Aaron, if you wanna jump in there next. Yeah, yeah I'll answer as a person that started with the company without a cell phone and <laughs> um, with, with <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I could have got a brick, but I, I did. <laughs> I had a pager, and we used a mobile phone or a uh, uh, coin op phone. So where are we at? I think it depends on where. You know, it, it varies significantly across the global landscape. Uh, you know, North America, farther ahead, and Southeast Asia, for example. You know, it just depends on how mature our businesses are there. Um, but we've come a long way. Our salespeople didn't have email addresses up until like 15 years ago. I mean, it, it's really come a long way and, and uh, it's embraced. Our customers demand it now and, and, and have for some time. I think it's a, it's a, it varies significantly across the landscape. Sure. You know, we're an M you know, we, I talked a little bit about our acquisition. You know, we do on average over the course of a hundred years, we do one every other year. So we bring them on and there's, there's variance. Sure. Huge differences, so it just depends on where. But I think it's a pretty broad spectrum. Okay. Mark, uh, it's front and center. Um, I talk more about user experience uh, than I probably ever had before. Um, where I get super proud is we just hired our first chief design officer, totally responsible for user experience end to end. So from the cab all the way through the corporate system, uh, and I think one of the key drivers of, of getting us there is we operate globally and the number one device is a mobile phone, right? And so I've got dealers and farmers in India that are trying to find ways to automate, but their only capability is through the phone. Um, we took a, you know, call it a $25,000 telematics system that's embedded on a vehicle and created a version on a phone for a tractor that has no vehicle electronics. And so those types of challenges forced us to go down this path. Uh, and I would say we were probably 10 years too late in regards to getting this role and this, this team up and running. Okay, Don? Yeah, and I would say where we're at is, you know, I just talked about that we're building new facilities and what we decided was those new facilities is where we're gonna go and make sure we put the most secure manufacturing environment in, segmented. And then from a user experience, our whole goal is that uh, we have a divisional president that just says, Nice and nice, easy requirement. Elim eliminate pens and paper. <laughs> you know, so it's actually been our Digital. goal. And so, <laughs> if you think about it, with the mobile apps and mobile devices, is you know we're really driving those facilities to test out where can we eliminate pens and paper as well as auto automation, both from a machinery as well as transactional. So we're, we're starting it, but we have a long ways to go. There's still a long journey. That's kind of what I heard from most people is like there, there's samples, but there's a long, long ways to go still. So, uh, which, is, which is good for everybody in this room because I think we'll all be a part <laughs> of it. So, um, well, thank you to our, our, our guests on the panel here, to Don, Mark, Aaron, Sam. Really appreciate it.